for next time. We're going to look at torts and cyber torts. <coughs> I have to put on my audio voice. So we're going to look at torts. Um, what, so what was a tort from the chapter? Right, it's a wrong to which you can get a recovery for. So it's a civil wrong, and the definition's coming up on a slide, but it's one of those civil types of cases. There's a bunch more coming, breach of contract, etc. but torts is the first major one that we talk about. Uh, and we'll look at negligence, we'll look at intentional torts, and we'll look at strict liability, and uh, we got a little time at the end, we'll talk about cyber torts, just because we like to say cyber. So a tort is a private civil legal action. Remember, that means you versus me, not the government as a prosecutor versus you, but you versus me. Uh, it could also be you suing the government, claiming they uh, injured you in some kind of tortious way. Uh, and as a result, uh, if you can show that you were injured in the way the law recognizes a remedy for, you could get compensatory damages or even punitive damages. Compensatory damages are actual losses like medical expenses, time off from work, pain and suffering. And then punitive damages are above and beyond actual damages. If it's really, really bad, then the court might give you more just to punish whoever did it. So does anybody remember the Ford Pinto? The Ford Pinto liked to blow up when you hit it. And as a result, in the trial, they found out that Ford had um, could have fixed the problem but didn't and now is paying out claims for people who were blown up or severely injured. And the court said, well, you know, just having them pay medical bills isn't enough. We want to punish them with an amount that will say, well, I won't do that again. And there's been other cases like that, too. So there are three broad categories of torts. And we were drawing them up on the board here earlier. Intentional torts, unintentional torts, or negligence. And then strict or absolute liability. So we're going to go into detail about each one of those. The plaintiff is still the plaintiff, the one who's claiming they were injured. But the defendant has a cool name, tortfeasor. I like that. I'm going to have a license plate that says tortfeasor. <coughs> so they're the one who allegedly committed the tort. And we're going to start by looking at some of the intentional torts. These are intentional torts against the person. And there's, there's tons of them. These are just a few. This is a common one. The one thing I don't like about this slide is the title says assault and battery. Like they always have to go together. But they don't. In fact, notice it says battery is a completed assault. Not always. If you're taking notes, you should write down, you can have an assault without a battery, and you can have a battery without an assault. So what's the difference? Let's go through that. So an assault is a reasonable apprehension or fear of an immediate contact. That's lawyer talk. And it's loaded with variables. First of all, reasonable. Reasonable to who? You guys know this by now? Who determines what's reasonable? The court does, right? Not you, not me. I'm not reasonable. Uh, apprehension or fear. I mean, think about it. Let's say you know somebody who every time somebody looks at them cross-eyed, they start crying. Is that reasonable apprehension or fear? Probably not, right? Um, and then the last part says immediate contact. If I said to you, if you come next week, I'm going to slap you, is that immediate contact? Do you have fear of an immediate contact? Uh, no, you don't. 
It's going to take a week. So what could you do before next week? <laughs> right? Take self-defense lessons. Right? Uh, what else could you do? How about just not come to class? Right? He's going to slap me. Report me. Right? Contact the police. We've got a slapping professor. So, well, that is a tough position. Is it worth the slap? So, uh, let's, let's make it even better. Let's say it's right now. Have you ever got one of those annoying, annoying, annoying sales calls where the person won't hang up? So let's say you get a phone call and you're like, no, thank you. I'm not interested. I said, no, thank you. Listen, if you keep talking, I'm going to kill you. Click. Now let's say whoever you're talking to is over a thousand miles away. Can you immediately harm them? No. You'd have to get on a plane, fly there, find them, and do it. Now, is it possible to threaten somebody in the next room? Isn't that like scary movie? Like, I'm outside your house and I'm going to do something to you? Yeah, it could be. Like, here's the thing. Um, there are many ways I could assault you. None of them involve an actual contact. You hear this a lot on the news. Somebody was assaulted. Well, really? Were they assaulted or were they battered? Like if, if, let's say, I'm coming at you right now with my fist. Aren't you fearful right now? Look at you. You look so fearful. Come on, act, act, act here. This is an assault. I don't have to make contact with him at all for it to be an assault. In fact, once I make contact with him with my fist, it becomes what? Battery. battery. So, as it says on the slide, one way you can have a battery is a completed assault. Saw it coming, saw it coming, bang, completed. <laughs> But isn't it possible that I could hit you without you knowing it's coming? Like, um, I walk in behind you, you sit down for class, and I'm like, you're late. Bam! Or I hit you first, and then I say you're late. Like, you don't even see it coming. So that would be a battery. Now, the other thing is, in back to your question about an injury or harm, don't let this one fool you. It doesn't have to be blood. It doesn't have to be a bruise. Let's say you're not as excited about torts as I am, and you start fading off in class. And I do all the teacher tricks. I come over and I raise my voice. Or I, you know, tap the table. Still, you're unresponsive. You're drooling all over the place, right? So I come over and I shove my tongue in your ear. <laughs> Now, there's no, there's no blood, there's no injury, there's no blue, blood, your uh, bruises, you're fine. Is that? <laughs> it's so wrong on so many levels. But it's a battery. It's a, this is a good one to write down, it's a consensual, a non-consensual contact. Let's say you're sleeping and I kiss you. Unless you want it, which we're not going to go into, that's non-consensual, right? That's a battery, even though there's no actual physical evidence of harm. Because the interest is, that's being protected is not so much no bruising or no blood. It's in your physical body and having somebody else not do things to it that you didn't ask them to do. Now, consent is a defense. If you said, kiss me, I wouldn't. But uh, if, if I did, and then later you're like, you battered me, you kissed me, what would I argue? You asked me to, you asked me to right? I mean, it would be like pay-per-view. Anybody pay like 70 bucks for a pay-per-view fight? On, okay, I don't know why you do that, but let's say uh, you do. Um, you invite all your friends over and you divvy up the cost of it or whatever. And you're watching. You all sit down with your popcorn or whatever you do when you watch boxing. I don't know. Do you put on boxing gloves or something? What, what do you do while you're watching boxing? Drink beers. Okay. So you're, you're drinking a beer and you're watching the boxing. And like the first punch out, 
the one the one guy connects with the other one, and the other guy's like, "Oh, you hurt me, battery! I'm suing." Isn't boxing consensual battery? That would be a really bad fight if the other person started crying and asked if they could sue for a tort. Now, sometimes your consent doesn't go further than what you believe is going to happen. Think of Mike Tyson. Right. Whoever was boxing him, was it, who was it? Vander yeah. So Evander, when he got in, he consented to be in a boxing match. <laughs> he didn't consent to have his ear bit off or parts of his ear bit off. So that exceeds the level of consent. Notice that defenses are just an argument that, yes, I may have done it, but I am excused under the law. doesn't mean you didn't do it. Like self-defense is an argument that, yeah, I hit you, but the reason I hit you is because you hit me. And we can go into all kinds of scenarios about self-defense and how much force or whatever. Um, but that becomes the question for the court to decide, is that self-defense? Is that enough force? Is that too much force? Um, sometimes it's defending your property, not yourself. And the law basically says you get to use less force for that. Texas. Except in Texas, you can just shoot people from your porch. Yeah. And no. Neighbor, right. Neighbor, no. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Uh, and there's lots of cases on that. Um, there was a famous case, Catco versus Briney, which is uh, really a criminal law case. But basically, a guy kept getting his barn broke into, and every time he'd call the police, he lived out in the country. By the time they got out there, whoever was stealing stuff was gone. So he took a shotgun, and he rigged a spring on the trigger to the door. And so the third time, they were breaking in, Boom! Wouldn't that be horrible if you forgot you put a spring gun on your door? <laughs> Ouch, yeah. One of his kids gets shot or something. So the court said you can't use that amount of force just to defend your property. If you could, then every place you went and opened the door, you'd be fearful that somebody was protecting it with a shotgun. Or anybody from Cedar Springs? Yes? So... <laughs> So let's say it was someplace else. Um, there was a, a guy who would often get drunk and naked. And, um, well, not in this, not in this light. Um, he, I, I heard from somebody from Cedar Springs that he had uh, issues with that, and mental issues, but he, he ended up one night in his neighbor's house drunk and naked. And the neighbor shot him and killed him. And the question in the case was, is that too much force? And I believe the court said no. And that's, the, the, I mean, those are the kind of cases is, you know, how much force is too much? I mean, if it's my house and I'm with my family and I'm woke up in the middle of the night by somebody who's drunk and naked, I'm not sure I'm going to ask them if they're there to take property or do something to me. I'm not giving you advice as to what you should do in that situation. But, yes? I just saw this summer I got me. I went to fifth class to see a lot of perfect. Awesome. But you're not packing right now, right? Okay. I know, but... Okay, good. I haven't sent it in yet. Okay. I'll remember that when it comes to grade time. But go ahead. Yeah, but it's not a license to shoot. Even if you're right, yeah, license to kill. That's a James Bond movie. Breaks into your house and is trying to steal right. your stuff or causing right. you harm. Right, the permit is about being able to conceal a weapon. And it's not about well, like I get a permit to shoot people. Definitely, that's what we're talking about. Tort law. Even if this good point, this is a defense. You killed somebody. That's tortious. You're not supposed to run around killing people. The question is, will the law excuse it or not? And then, the, like, maybe the state won't sue you, but then they said the family of the victim. Right. Yeah, the state doesn't sue you. I mean, the state could prosecute you, um, but the question is, yeah, in that case, uh, victim's family, wrongful death action, 
you know? <laughs> yeah, and the, f the, the fact that you have a concealed weapon permit does not excuse you from shoot, allow you to well, shoot I people. Someone's like stealing from your house and you get woken up and right. you see them running out of your house with your belongings and you like shooting the leg or something to stop them. Yeah, that happens in westerns too. <laughs> it's always in the movies where you shoot to wound, not to kill. Yeah, right. Can they still like shoot? Oh, sure they can. What? Even let's. On your property, right, so yes. Like let's let's get forward. this out of the way now and remember it for the whole course. You can get sued for almost anything by anybody. Period. It doesn't matter if they're in your house breaking in and you didn't do anything wrong. They could sue you. Now, whether they recover is a different thing, and all those facts come into play. But let me tell you, there's no rule that says if you shoot them in the back, that's bad. If you shoot them in the front, that's okay. I mean, there's just not rules like that. Each case is, is dependent. Now, I mean, some of the facts can be persuasive. If the person's not in your house... Like, let's say I happen to look out the window of my front door and I notice my neighbor naked walking their dog in the middle of the night. Maybe they just like to do that. It's, you know, no one's around and they feel free and the dog, you know, whatever. <laughs> that doesn't mean I get to open up on them, you know, start shooting at them. Well, why does the law tell you to shoot to kill? Not like I don't know if there is a law that says <laughs> shoot to kill. Tell you, like, Take the gun class. Oh, they, they tell you they, they don't shoot to harm them. I mean, to injure them or whatever. Really? You take a gun class that says shoot people? No, seriously, did they tell well, you that? Well, they said because you're not supposed to shoot anybody. If mm -hmm. at you, Number one rule don't run around shooting people. Well, it says don't try to get out. But if somebody is coming, if they come into your house and then they turn around, you can't shoot in the back. They're no longer coming at you. And, and I'm, I'm just saying that so all of this might be training or advice that somebody gave you. But there's not a law that says, shoot them here, that's okay. Shoot them here, that's not okay. Well, the instructors that's teaching the class, yes, they say you definitely. Shoot them, you shoot to kill them. Well, now, you now this is, is the I, <coughs> right. The Marine no, laws. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, uh, was it last year, the year before last, a guy that was on uh, Boston and Kalamazoo, he was uh, attacked by some guy out of story. He picked up a trash can and he go to hit him, and he had a pistol on him. He shot him and killed him. So do you shoot him in a leg just because he, you know, he's getting ready to hit you with a trash can, you kill him. You get hit by the trash can, you yeah. die. What, what, is that your loss or his gain? Or, yeah. you know, you gotta I don't know how many people per year are killed by trash cans, <laughs> but I'm betting it's a lot less than by guns. I'm just going to go out on a limb. Well, yeah, but, but I, I think you might be missing the point in that training. Like, if you're going to commit to use lethal force, you know, this whole, I mean, that's probably what was said. This whole shoot in this spot to wound, shoot in this other spot to kill. Eh, I can tell you that's a bunch of hogwash. Because if you shoot somebody, it's going all over their body. But anyway, let's, let's, not, let's not go there. But the whole using lethal force for non-lethal things, sometimes that can be tough. Like, what is lethal force? I mean, can you kill someone with a trash can? You betcha. I was I prosecuted a case where one guy bludgeoned somebody to death with a TV. Now that doesn't mean if your roommate picks up a TV, you boom. That just means that it could happen. Question, comment, before we move on. I'm just going to say, in self defense, right? You are. Some people are taught that if you don't make sure that you all. Uh, Put that person in a position that they can't take right. your weapon away from you and right. use it on you. Right. Yeah, this this is probably along that same string, and that is that if you're going to introduce a weapon into a situation, realize that same weapon could kill you. Yeah. All righty, we should move on. It's fun to talk about weapons, but <laughs> all right. You have yours? Uh, not on me, no. <laughs> you know, I'm being recorded, so <laughs> I don't really want to go into a lot of detail about that. Just <laughs> 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 All right, false imprisonment. Uh, this comes up in a business setting a lot in terms of uh, shoplifting. Does anybody work in retail in here? Anybody? So, or, or have maybe at some point. What do they tell you about confronting people who are stealing stuff from your store? You can't really. Don't do it. Uh, and if you do anything, you contact the people who are trained to do it. And even they have rules around, like, 
there's loss prevention inside the stores in the mall, and then there's the security for the mall. And what we do on weekends, because I'm cheap, is we make popcorn at home, bring it to the mall, and watch people chase people around. It's, <laughs> it's really cheap entertainment. Uh, because a lot of the stores in the mall have rules. If somebody's walking out the door with your stuff, let them go. Because what kind of liability can you have if you try to physically stop someone? They could sue you, claiming they're falsely imprisoned, like they have a right to their liberty and you're imposing on that. You don't have probable cause to do that. Uh, that you injured them, or you get injured. I mean, the store is telling you don't confront and stop people or chase them around because you could be injured. One of my favorites was somebody said, I work for Meyer. Not that I'm saying bad things about Meyer. And their policy is wait till they get past the cash register out of the store and confront them in the parking lot. Now, first of all, I don't know if that's a true policy or not, but can you imagine letting somebody get out into the parking lot and then try to confront them about stolen goods? Guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to get ran over. They're going to pull something from the glove compartment. It's, it's just not good to chase people around in a car-filled parking lot. Like there was, it was a, I think, a kid in Cascade last year somebody stole something from the store, he chased them out of the store, they ran him over with a car. I just don't know if it's, I mean, it could be <laughs> Forest Hills food, yes, yes. I'm not making these up. I make a lot of things up, but I didn't make that. All right, infliction of emotional distress. You can hear that a lot on TV, I'm suing for emotional distress. Now, it has to be extreme and outrageous <laughs> conduct. So, this isn't um, you know, you heard about a plane crashing. This is watching your family crash in a plane in front of you. Um, all, some courts require physical symptoms. So it's not enough to just say, I'm emotionally distressed. You'd actually have to have some outward manifestations of that. I don't know what that is. Hives, rash, convulsions. Uh, some, I mean, may, an expert probably come in and say you're, you're, emotionally distressed about it. So there's a couple more torts. Defamation is a big one. Defamation is publication of a false statement uh, that injures someone's good reputation. Again, you know, if you guys were thinking like lawyers, it's loaded. Publication. If Before you come in class, I pull you aside in my office and I say, you know what, you're the dumbest student I've ever had. You know, I looked at your quiz one score. I don't think, I mean, separate from sleeping through the quiz, I don't know how you could have done worse. You're the dumbest student ever. Now, would that hurt your feelings? It would, wouldn't it? It would really hurt your feelings, and I would never say that about you. Um, so, but that's between you and me, right? That's not publication, right? So, I, I mean, if I came in here and started telling all the rest of the world about your problems then maybe that might be publication. But then we move on. False statement. Whatever I'm saying about you has to be false. I'm intentionally saying a lie about you. If I come in here and I tell everybody that you scored a one on the first quiz, that's not a false statement if you did. So it's not defamation. Now again, like I was saying earlier, should I be projecting your scores up on the screen? No. But it wouldn't be defamation, because those are your scores. Um, if it's oral, it's slander. If it's written, it's called libel. Sometimes it can be a combination. Don't let that trick you. Like on the internet or TV, you could see and hear something. Yes? If it's fact or opinion. Right. So, Well, it says opinions are free speech and generally not actionable. So what we're talking about is uh, if I say, I think you're stupid, you know, does that level to the, to the, um, or rise to the level that's actionable? I don't know. You know, I don't know if that would be harmful to your reputation to everyone else if I said that. Like they would just say, well, that's his opinion. Well, again, if I showed you, you're not saying I necessarily showed everybody else. Well, I, what, what does the fact opinion mean if they said uh, question? I mean, how do you want to define that? Right? 
Um, that's how I would define it. It says opinions are free speech and generally not actionable. So what we're usually talking about asserting something about somebody that people would believe is fact when in fact it's false. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I have to publish to others in order for it to be uh, defamation. And then it goes on to say a good reputation. <laughs> if you already have a horrible reputation for it, and I say the same thing, even if it's not true, it's not necessarily that harmful to you. Um, and there's also cases where we, you know, anybody see like the National Enquirer or something as you're going through the checkout or whatever. Come on, you look at it. You know those papers that yeah. say bad things about people? Um, don't you look at those and go, aren't those defamatory? I mean, they're, they're putting somebody in a false light. They seem to depict them uglier than they are or whatever it is. Marsha or Marsha. Uh, Oprah has Martian baby. Right? You know. But I think generally that's entertainment. I don't think that's a representation of actual fact. I don't think people look at that and go, oh, my goodness, Oprah's having a Martian baby. How did that happen? Maybe there are people like that. I think she is, though. Um, we already talked about libel and slander. Uh, there is uh, this idea of slander per se, which is per se means on its face. In other words, if you hear it, it's just automatically bad. I bet you wonder what those are, don't you? I bet it's on the next slide. There it is. So if, if somebody says this kind of stuff about you, then you don't have to prove you're actually damaged. Just juries, judges would know right away, oh, yeah, that's, that's horrible. Some loathsome communicable disease. Some professional impropriety. You know, you, you spread it around that I uh, embezzled my client's money or I was imprisoned. The last one, I'll let you look up what unchaste means. Make sure you have safe search on when you do. All right. Um, defenses. We already mentioned one, truth, right? If, if defamation is saying something false, then if it's true, it's not defamation. Could it be something else? If I come in and disclose to everybody your grades, isn't that private information? So it might be some other kind of tort, but it's not defamation. Privilege. Sometimes... People are allowed to say really bad things about each other. Politicians do this a lot. And for the most part, they can get pretty far without it being actionable. Uh, in fact, politicians, movie stars, they, they fall under this public figure category. They put themselves in the public light, so they should expect the public has some crazies in it who will say crazy things and they should have tough skin about it and the only way they're going to be able to recover is they, they could show that it was done with actual malice so in in some cases some stars have been successful in suing National Enquirer or other publications and say you went too far with what you said about me What's the actual, malice? actual malice is showing that the publication was intended to harm that person's reputation like when they did it, they meant they did it for that reason. Right. All right, inv invasion of privacy. I was giving you an example of that. If you came into my office and you said, um, I have a loathsome communicable disease, right? Um, and then I came in here and I told everybody, I'm like, hey, how's that loathsome communicable disease you got going? Right? In front of everyone. That wouldn't be defamation, right? We already talked about that. That would be a fact. But it may be this. You know, it's private information that should not get out publicly. So there's all kinds of different invasions of the right to privacy from taking someone else's identity to portraying them in a false light to disclosing information about them that's supposed to remain private. And that's what these other slides talk about, like appropriation. Um, if I 
act like somebody else and it harms their reputation. What was the example they used in the chapter? Was it Vanna White or something? I don't know. If I, if, what if I came in class and instead of putting these slides up here, I started rolling over the letters and I had a long evening gown on and I looked just like Vanna White? Okay, I wouldn't. Never mind. Fraudulent misrepresentation. Now that's stuck in your head. Fraudulent or intentional misrepresentation. There are some cases where you say something that's a misrepresentation, but you don't intend it. There are others when, when you say it, you know it's wrong, and you're doing it because you want someone else to rely on it. So fraudulent misrepresentation needs those four things listed up there. You knowingly misrepresent a fact, not opinion. You do it with the intent to induce the other party who's innocent to rely on it. And they do. And their reliance ends up harming them. So let's say I go to buy a used car. And whoever the used car salesperson is, they rolled back the odometer on the car. And I say, how many miles does that car have on it? And they look in the window at the odometer and they say, oh, it's only got 10,000 miles. They know the odometer has been rolled back because they did it. And they are saying it to me, the innocent party, I wasn't involved in rolling anything back, so that I will rely on that and buy it. Now, what's my harm for buying a car that has more miles on it than I think? I'm paying more than I should for the car, right? Now, well, some people found out, like, it only is supposed to have 10,000 miles, and they take it off a lot, and it starts falling apart. And they take it to get fixed, and the person's like, how many miles do you think this has on it? Well, 10,000. Uh, well, no, it's got a lot more than that. It's got 100,000, and as we look at it, we can see that it's been tampered with. So you can find out. I mean, sometimes it should be obvious. Other it's times, like not so much. You're telling me that you're 20-some years old? No, I'm sorry. You know what I'm saying? Are you calling me an old lady or an old person? I'm confused like, there. If you got this old, old lady and she's trying to tell you that she's only got this many years. Oh, you're saying the old lady is engaging in fraudulent misrepresentation. Did this, ha did this happen to you? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think in some cases it's pretty obvious. In other cases it's not so obvious. Okay, good. Uh, you better stop there. We're being recorded. All right. Uh, notice that there's a difference between fact and opinion or puffery. Now, puffery is puffing up your product, saying things about it that are exaggerations. Like, um, when I went to buy my uh, minivan, I was concerned, you know, minivan, not my image. But the salesperson said, you look hot in that minivan, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking, wow, I must look hot. I better buy this minivan. Now, I relied on the representation, right? But is it a representation of fact, or is it just puffing up or an opinion? It's just opinion. No one should rely on that. No one should justifiably rely on that. That didn't really happen. But uh, Now, notice justifiable reliance. What if someone says to you, the car is in good shape, but you don't rely on that. You take it and get it independently assessed by a mechanic. And then the mechanic says, this thing is a piece of, it's, it's bad shape, All right? So now you go back and you're like, eh, this thing's in bad shape, but it's still a really good deal, I'll do it. So have you justifiably relied? No, so you need all those things in order to have fraudulent misrepresentation. Now, is it possible that somebody could misrepresent something to you and not know they are? I had a case where I was mentioning this, and one of my students said they were selling cars, and a guy came in and said, I need a car, or a van in this case, that has power seats. And he turned around to look at the sticker in the window, and it said power seats, power windows, power everything. And he said, well, then here's one. The guy buys it, takes it off the lot, he calls, and he says, this doesn't have power seats. There's nothing 
no switches, no nothing, and I look underneath there, and there's no motor, there's no power. It turned out the manufacturer put the wrong sticker on the vehicle. He misrepresented something. He said he sold a car that had, he said had power seats, and it didn't, but he didn't know. So, so who's that well, I, I think it's negligent. I mean, I think somebody is going to have to pay. I don't think you should be stuck with something that has the wrong sticker on it. But I don't know if it's fraudulent. Maybe he just switched the stickers. I know. Like if you're if you're looking for that feature, I would check for it. Maybe I'm making the story up. I don't know. But you get the idea. You what? He still does. Come on. I don't want to say. And people would come up and say, you know, this this these jeans are marked down. I'm like, no. Oh. Hey, well, you said it says it marked down, so I get them for that price. No, I don't. You know. So they were committing fraud. No, they were. Maybe, maybe it was advertising fraud. I mean, because they accidentally marked one thing down. Okay, one. so you're saying you didn't know. Yeah. This okay. Is the one they came up with. So you might be, somebody might be representing something that's not true, but not know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's and a good I example. Them, you know, I can't sell you right. Right. It's, it's just like my used car example, except a lot more <laughs> fragrance and shutters on the windows. Oh, well, yeah, music, too. And music. All right. Abusive or frivolous litigation. So here's a tort that says it's not about suing for a tort. It's about suing because somebody's suing. Right? It's saying that the, the tortious conduct is somebody maliciously prosecuting or abusing process by constantly litigating things that shouldn't be litigated. This is pretty hard. Like proving the prosecutor maliciously prosecuted you or that somebody is so frivolous that it's tortious. That's a tough one, but it could happen. The author threw that one in there so you can have a new edition of the textbook and you could buy it. All right. Wrongful interference with a contract. Kind of more of a business application. For this one, you need a contract. <coughs> There's another tort coming up where you don't. But you need a valid enforceable contract between the parties, and then all of a sudden comes along a third party who interferes with that contract, gets, them to, gets one of the parties of the contract to breach it. So this is not third party innocently coming along and trying to get somebody to buy their product, and one of the parties of the contract breaches the contract. This is, hey, you really need to get out of that contract. Breach. That's the sound of a contract breaching. <laughs> Breach. Does that make sense? So this is what happens when a third party, knowing of a contract, gets one of the parties to breach it. But even if there's not a contract, you could still intentionally interfere with a business relationship. You know two parties do business. They may not be in a contract, but you say things about one of the parties that's more than just competition. It's more than just our product is better than theirs. Our price is better than theirs. It's they're, they're criminals or they're going to go into bankruptcy when that's not true. You know, it's kind of it's like one type of business slander. Um, so one of the defenses is, at the bottom there, um, not wrongful interference, but we were doing it in the spirit of competition. My wife and I were driving the other day, and we saw one of these um, people who stand on street corners with s signs and um, advertise for pizza. Now, this has been going on for years, but I've noticed lately that the people who do that are very energetic. Like, they're dancing all over the place, and, I mean, it's some kind of... Do you know what's going on there? Uh, no. No. Uh, and that little uh, piece of Happy's Pizza? Oh, the dance right. Hands up and the back. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know if it's like a person who travels around, but I've noticed that the level of competition. I bet there's going to be a TV show about that soon, where like there's going to be three judges and people do their thing. But anyway, um, really, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's distracting. But anyway, so here's a guy. He's got headphones on. He's got a pizza sign. He's just going crazy. But he's just advertising for this one pizza company. 
Now, what could you do to change the facts where he's actually intentionally interfering with another pizza company's business? I, yeah, I, you know, that's, yeah, we're getting there. Maybe Domino's causes food poisoning or something, right? Right, yeah, I mean, if, if you intentionally interfere by going on their property and standing in front of their door and saying Domino's sucks and have your sign there, then that might be going too far. All right, intentional torts against property instead of persons. Trespass to land is both a criminal statute, but also, as you have up there, a um, trespass to land. And it's not just skinny stick people. It could also be, sorry, um, it could also be like putting your stuff on their property. So you dump a bunch of gravel on there. That would be a trespass to land because it's all about, um, Pur for purposes of the recording, because nobody here knows what I'm talking about, there's a stick person on the board over there. Um, it could be a pile of gravel, and that would be enough to prevent somebody from being able to use that part of their property. Now, notice the last bullet there. Actual damage or harm to the property is not required. Technically, it's a trespass if you go somewhere that's clearly labeled not to, which says you don't have permission to be here, or you go there and then they say, don't be there. Which that happens a lot in the business world, right? Business invitees come on in, but then you do something or something happens and they say, you know what? You're no longer welcome here. All right. Could be trespass to personal property. Uh, trespass to personal property is the civil side of stealing. <coughs> you know how in a crime there's larceny shoplifting. This is you interfering with someone else's right to use their own personal property. Let's use your book as an example. Let's say I like to um, take books from students and go sell them in the bookstore and keep the money. Right? There's a criminal statute that says I shouldn't steal books. But you also have a tort claim against me because it was your book and I interfered with your right to use it. That's the civil side of it. Then there's conversion, which is a little different. What if I borrow your book? Now I have your book. Did I steal it? it no. When I, say, when I say borrow, I mean you consensually gave it to me. Right? So it's not stealing if someone gives you the book. But I could convert it to my own or a different use, right? I say, can I borrow your book? And then I go sell it. Or in Cedar Springs, if your neighbor asks for the lawnmower and then the neighbor takes it and races it, because that's what they do up there. Right? Well, at the time they're racing there. Anyway. <laughs> So um, it's converting something to a different use. I mean, if I'm asked to borrow my neighbor's lawnmower, the assumption is I'm doing that to mow my grass, and then I'm going to give it back. If they come over and I'm selling at a yard sale, that's probably not what they thought I was going to do with it. And we'll skip that case. All right. Uh, just like I could slander people, I can slander property. I can say something about the property that's not true. Like one of the biggest ways uh, attorneys get into trouble for this is they file a lien on the wrong piece of property. So their, their client has a legitimate claim and they want to say this party cannot sell their property without paying off a judgment or a lien except they put it on the wrong piece of property. Well guess what happens when that other owner tries to sell their property? Yeah, it's got a lien on it, and it's worth less than it should be. That's injury. So you got to be careful about liens. All right. Um, we're pretty close to being out of time, aren't we? All right. Yeah, I don't think so. We can do it. Not a problem. All right. In order to have negligence, you need these four things. I don't even need to show you the rest of the slides because the slides go into detail about each one of these things. But you probably should write down these things or at least on the slide highlight the key word. 
you need a duty. You have to owe a duty to someone else before you can be liable for negligence. A breach of that duty. So duty, breach, there has to be an injury. And then causation. Your negligence caused their harm. So let's use a stop sign. I owe duty to stop at a stop sign. I don't. I go through it. If no one's there and I don't injure anybody, no negligence. Is it irresponsible? Is it possibly a violation of some criminal statute? Sure, but it's not negligence if I don't harm anybody. Um, let's say you're late for class, you're speeding, I'm in the crosswalk where I'm supposed to be, you hit me. Who's responsible? Whoever's, why, why am I responsible? I'm walking in the crosswalk. Oh, no, you're speeding. Did I say I'm speeding? Okay, I'm. Uh, now let's say you're speeding because you're late for class. I'm jaywalking. Well, I don't know if it doesn't matter. Does that mean I have a free license to start running people over if they're jaywalking? Hey, you, you're supposed to be in the crosswalk. <clears throat> So now, isn't there a potential that there's both liability on both parties' part? Now, let's say you're going the speed limit, and I jump out from a tree in the dark in a ninja suit in front of you to see if you can stop. <laughs> now who's at fault? I am, clearly, right? So that's what these cases are all about. Is a duty owed? If I'm a lifeguard, I owe a duty to stop somebody from drowning. But if I'm not, I'm just walking down the beach, I see somebody drowning, unless I have some kind of legal relationship with them, I'm not responsible. All right. And then the last thing, uh, I'll just jump to it, strict liability. I don't want you to miss this one. Liability without fault. Doesn't matter if you intended the harm or not. There's a statute that says if you got a pit bull, in some places. Wild animals, like a crazy wild elephant, or you engage in inherently dangerous activities like explosives or fireworks, then you're liable for whatever happens. So strict liability is primarily statutory law, and it says you're liable even though you didn't mean to cause the harm. All right, remember for next time, Answer those group questions individually and come prepared to come up with your group answer. I want a question.